This is the Balkan Adventures podcast. Everyday life and experiences in the Western Balkans. This podcast relies entirely on supporters who help to keep us sponsor and advert free through our community at patreon.com. You can pledge as little as $1 a month with early access to content and free giveaways. You will find a banner to our Patreon community on our website at balkanadventures.co. Thanks for helping us develop the podcast. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Balkan Adventures podcast with me, David Bailey. And in this episode, we're talking about Balkan beer. Uh, we're not talking about the beer that you get in a bottle in a coffee bar or restaurant or even the good old Tochno, the draft beer. We're not talking traditional local Bosnian beer, but rather craft beer, which is now being produced in a range of microbreweries across the whole of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the region more widely. I catch up with a microbrewery that's not been long in existence, not too far away from where I live near the town of Laktashi in northern Bosnia-Herzegovina. I'm catching up in this episode with Nikola Garlic, the owner of the Gorstak Brewery in Glamorchani, which is a small village between Laktashi and Banja Luka, to find out more about what it means to be a craft brewer in the Western Balkans. But first, let's find out a little bit more about Nikola himself. I was born there, I attended university there, I lived there, <laughs> so yeah, I'm from Banja Luka. But we're not sat in Banja Luka today, we're sat out, outside in, in um, you know, we're, we're pretty rural at the moment for a Banja Luka boy. Uh, yeah, this is maybe halfway from Banja Luka to Laktashi. Yeah, I found this space and I decided it, w- it would be, uh, it might be great for a small brewery and uh, yeah, since then I'm, I'm here. You had this dream. We were talking a little bit earlier. You said, you know, you were a, a hobby brew, brewer and now you've turned it into the start of a commercial concern. Let's go back. With the way that Balkan culture is that, you know, craft beers aren't from the culture, you know, rakias from the culture, um, wine is from the culture and beer is sort of like traditionally mass produced with every city having its own sort of brand. How did you get involved with craft beer well i always liked to drink beer and uh, one day i found out that it was possible to make beer at home and i was astounded by th- that fact and uh, started to dig deep into the books into internet forums started to meet with other people who also liked to make beer at home and uh, it was initially only a few of us from Banja Luka. and all this started at the end of 2014 and by occasion I went to Las Vegas that year in the January 2015 for the first time as a translator for a friend of mine at uh, a fair. I purchased the first pieces of, of uh, home brewing kits uh, there and uh, the rest I finished here and started to make my first beer by the summer of 2015 and uh, the moment I tried my first glass of beer I knew that this is this was the only thing that I wanted to do to the rest of my life and from that day on I tried to uh, improve every new beer and, and try to learn all about the process. I read maybe <laughs> 10,000 uh, pages of all the all kinds of books and all, all stuff about brewing. Now I'm I'm living my dream, you know, that, that I started uh, a year ago maybe. Uh, I sold my apartment, I invested all in this idea and, uh, and uh, I'm quite happy how it's going right now so far. You know when you were in Las Vegas and you said you've, you, you bought your first kit, when I was in, in the States, I saw that they used to sell like 
large boxes and, and in it you would have all the sort of ingredients that you need and it's they called it a starter kit and a bit like one of these white uh, plastic um, bin type yeah, containers yeah, yeah. you go is, is that how you started uh, not not actually I, I bought only a few pieces of equip- equipment there but I st- started uh, all grain brewing from the very first batch I didn't want to go into extracts it's too easy I think <laughs> I improvised with with uh, other other pots and barrels used for, for making sauerkraut here. Uh, these were initial fermenters and later on I turned these freezers into fermentation chambers with controlled uh, temperature environment so I could get the you know consistent fermentation uh, temperatures and results in the end. So it was a lot of in- improvis- improvisation along the way and I had uh, a lot of help uh, from other guys from all over the country and the countries near B- BNH, Croatia and Serbia. We, we went to visit many of their uh, craft breweries, uh, craft beer festivals. These were all occasions when, when I learned something new each time. And all of that helped me uh, you know, become what I am now, a craft brewer <laughs> from Banja Luka. You said, you said that you, know, you started, this was a hobby yeah. for you. So when you got into the hobby stage, was it even then that you had it in your mind that, hey, I, I, I can make so much more out of this? Yeah, I, I, I've, I have always been a dreamer and I always believed uh, that I can achieve something if, if, I, if, I, you know, if I desire it from the heart. Time passed and, <laughs> and uh, this idea turned out to be becoming a, a reality. When you say you're a dreamer, and I, th- I think there should be more dreamers um, in the Balkans personally, you sold your apartment, you invested everything into this. You've got to agree with me that when you, when you talk to, to other people, to most people, there's huge negativity in the country. There's huge jealousy. There's, what is it, the phrase here, people spit on you. There's, there's almost this schadenfreude about, ha, how long will it be before he fails? Not, ha, how long is it going to be before he's successful? And this affects people some in such a profound way. You've been doing this now, and it seems that you don't care about the haters, you don't care about the negativity, but it must have been a bit d- difficult at times. Well, that's true, and uh, I always try to surround myself with, with you know, good, normal, positive people who will always tell me if, there, if there's something wrong, okay, tell me, and what would you do to make it right? Don't just you know, criticize it without, no, of, without offering idea how to solve it. Yes, there is a lot of negativity in the country and, and you know, people are just too much overwhelmed by the news, by the media, by all the politics and, and all that. And I think that's just a big waste of time and energy and life's too short to be bothered by those, those things. Uh, you must try to, to, you know, be good with everyone else around you and, and if someone is trying to, to achieve something, Okay, support him, try to help him, don't uh, make it more difficult for him. If you don't like what he's doing, okay, turn around and go, do, go the other way, leave him be. And that's, that's the way I think, and uh, I mean, uh, people's opinion is important to me, but I'm aware of the fact that we are not all the same, you know. <laughs> Everyone has the right to, to think on their own. So far, as for my beers, our, our brewery beers, reactions were very positive and uh, I encountered nothing but support, really, from everybody, from both uh, from Banja Luka, from Mostar, from Sarajevo, from all the cities. It's quite different than the, than the, than the general per- perception. The name of your brewery, your microbrewery, is mm. Gorstak. I hope I pronounced that right. Mm. And that means mm. Highlander. Banja Luka lies in the plain between Middle Bosnia, the mountainous region of Bosnia, all the way up through Croatia up until the next mountain ranges which border onto Hungary. So a flat part of the Western Balkans. So why did you call it Highlander? Well, there are actually mountains near Banja Luka, mountains of Manjača and Kozara, and this is where my grandfather fathers, uh, came from. So they were in, uh, you know, true Highlanders, people who were uh, tough, who were honest, to, who, were, who lived in harmony with everybody else around them and sought, <laughs> sought, sought nothing but what they could, could make and create by, by their own, by, the, by themselves, sorry. This name is a, is a kind of a, a tribute to them and to their lives, lives and to everything I th- 
taught from them. Also, I'm a big nature lover and I like to spend time outdoors yeah, in the nature and so on. So Highlander is the right name for, for, <laughs> for a beer uh, made by, you know, by this brewery. How does the family feel about it that you've actually taken some of the family roots and you now got it firmly entrenched into your, into your business? Yeah, well, they su- support me and they are glad that I'm doing this and they, they w- were maybe scared in the beginning and... Uh, you know, didn't, didn't believe much that this could be actually a reali- reality, but uh, in time, you know, they showed, showed a lot of support and understanding for everything I'm, I'm doing, and uh, it's, it's great. My grandfathers aren't uh, alive now, but I think they would be glad too, so this is in their name. When we sat down this morning, uh, even though it was before 10 o'clock, and you said, would you like to have a beer? And I went, hmm, why not? Um, and there were four, four types um, on offer, and you were talking about... Um, IPAs. I didn't know, even though I'm, I'm British, uh, I didn't know too much about the history of IPA, but you've already researched that and you know more about it um, than I do, which I've, I feel is pretty, pretty cool. India Pale Ale, hundreds of years old, uh, a beer that was designed to be shipped out to the farthest reaches of what was then the British Empire, which would then be turned into local beer, initially for the troops to enjoy. How hard has it been to recreate these original styles of beer, or which are now called craft beers, basically? I think it's the foundation for it. Um, here in a culture that you might not have the right ingredients, the right temperatures, there must have been a lot of obstacles for you. Well, actually, uh, thankfully, uh, I'm not the first one that started this hobby here. There, there were some other microbreweries in the country, and some of them obtained all the necessary raw materials you, you needed to, to make beer. So it wasn't a problem at all. And of course, now I have access to Yakima Valley hops, you know, freshest, best hops in the world, Slovenian hops also, and uh, malts from Germany, from Austria, from, from uh, uh, England also. And uh, we don't have any problems with obtaining all the, all the ingredients, but uh, it's always a challenge to try to recreate something that was made two or three hundred years ago because no one exactly knows how that beer uh, might have tasted back then. We have all these assumptions, we, we, but we have never tried it. It's, it's quite challenging, but it's possible, and many breweries are doing a great job in, in ju- doing just that. I, I'm going to try my best at, at uh, English IPAs and uh, at many other spiced beers, many beers with, uh, made, made with some plants and instead of hops. And I also make mead, honey wine, and this is still a, ho- a hobby, and it's, maybe it will be uh, you know, a part of this bre- brewery in the future. Uh, it's basically uh, honey fermented uh, from the wild yeast within them and from wild yeast uh, from fruits or tree bark or anything that you might find. It's, it's also it's very exciting to, to be a part of that and to be someone who is reliving this old tradition of making beer and making mead and uh, it's some kind of, of a way to, to go back to the roots, you know, to, to try to, to be part of the movement of people who try to, to produce as much as they can by, them, by themselves, by their hands. I also cultivate a garden, I eat my own vegetables that I uh, grow. I also grow hops for some experiments you know, in beer. Yeah, I, I, I try to be as much as independent as I can from the, all the mass-produced foods and drinks and all that, you know, self-sufficient. You're alluding there that you could be, you know, you're developing, you know, your own hops now. Um, Bosnia hasn't, as far as I'm aware, hasn't been a country that, that hops naturally come from. Or yeah, I, I, might, I, might, I might be wrong there, but you don't normally hear about Bosnian hops being used in the brewing process, or, or, or have I got that wrong? Hops are not grown here uh, commercially, unfortunately, but uh, there's a lot, a lot of wild hops everywhere, anywhere you go. You, you know, in, in Banja Luka, in the, in the very city center, you can find hop vines cr- climbing uh, up a, a building or something like that, especially in the areas, uh, in the countryside also, I still haven't used them for brewing. I have them actually in the freezer right there. I, I harvested them and uh, I'm eager to see what I'm going to get from them. But it's possible, you know, to grow hops here, to, to make uh, bar- barley malt to, to grow for beer. 
but it's not done commercially, unfortunately. So we have to import all, all these ingredients. Is that an expensive part of the operation, the import of the ingredients to create the final product? Yes, of course. I, I think it would be best if we had uh, domestic production of these raw materials and in the end beer would be cheaper you know, for the customer. And we could also make many new interesting beers that couldn't be made anywhere else because every region has its own uh, characteristics, every climate, every soil, every amount of rainwater or snow, er all that uh, influences the, the taste and flavors and aromas and, and the characteristics of that particular hop or barley or whatever is used. We're sat in, in your microbrewery, which is, I have to say, quite small. You've got machines, I think, for dealing with, yeah. with the grain. Um, there are these wonderful aluminium fermenters. fermenters. Um, you've got fridges that you've adapted, uh, a hand labeler, and racking with loads and loads of bottles yeah. of product and of course the traditional wood burner which adds that certain thing to being here <laughs> you said that to me earlier that you this is a one-man operation at the moment with some occasional help from friends how difficult is it to handle the stress of now running a business on your own to deal with every part of that from i don't know how many bottles are behind you there must be a good few hundred uh, around 900 liters that's about Nearly 2,000 bottles. So 2,000 bottles have been, you know, individually capped uh, and prepared. The stress must be phenomenal. Yes, where we are organized as an agricultural uh, cooperative. There's five of us, but I'm mostly in charge of, of the entire process, from the production to sales to distribution to label designs and everything. So I get occasional help from them when it's when it's time to bottle beer and to label it, but all the other aspects are, you know, my, uh, my business. Um, talk us through the, the, the process of, you know, from when you get these bags mm -hmm. of malt and hops that we can see down here next to the, um, uh, your, your, your white fermenting barrels, what happens next? Uh, comes, here, comes here to the malt mill, I mill the grains and uh, at the same time I prepare uh, water uh, for brewing the next, the next day. Uh, each style, for each style, I prepare a special water profile, you know, by, by partially filter, uh, filtering water in combination with the tap water and uh, with the addition of some uh, minerals that are already in water by na uh, naturally, but you just want to, to change their, uh, the amount of them for each individual style. For example, uh, if you'd like to, to emphasize uh, hop bitterness and aroma, you, will, you might want to have a bigger con concentration of sulfates than chlorides in, in water. So that's the kind of things that I would do in the preparation. Uh, on the brewing day, uh, there's the pro standard process of, of production. You know, you, you f first you have mashing when you mix uh, the milled grains and water and you keep it in a certain temperature temperature range for a certain amount of time. Then you transfer it to boil kettle where it boils, uh, you, fresh wort, you know, boils. You add hops, uh, later you, you, cool, you cool it and you transfer it to the fermenter. You uh, add oxygen to, to wort, add uh, yeast, and it remains there for two or three weeks for fermentation and uh, maturation after that you have a uh, bottling and uh, beer still has to to remain around uh, two weeks in bottles up to a month before it it uh, goes to you know to sale so this whole process lasts for uh, 20 to 40 or 50 days depending on the style here this i mean this looks like an absolutely pristinely clean uh, environment. Um, places like this don't stay clean on their own. It takes a lot of effort. So not only are, do you have your, your thing that you love, but there's a lot of the, if I can say, mundane, boring stuff about yeah. keeping it absolutely uh, clean because this is for public consumption. Yeah. That must take a lot of your time as well. Yeah, that's the worst part of the business. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the end of the brew day, uh, which lasts around nine to ten hours, you have to clean everything, everything, and that's quite a mess. 
and you have to to get inside the boil kettle and to scrub all that stuff and uh, you know it's really uh, time consuming also you have to clean the fermenters before uh, making a new batch uh, right before putting the uh, wort inside so yeah you have to pay attention to hygiene uh, because it's crucial to avoid infections and beer spoilage and all that because beer is very sensitive it's it's uh, it's. I think it's the most difficult beverage that what man can make, you know, because there are around hundred different factors uh, affecting one beer at the same time, and you have to to learn to to manage all of them and to to control them to so they could produce the product that you want to to have, you know. What's it been like to to market it, especially that you're not an expert on it? So that's been another. Uh, experience a massive experience a massive leap into the unknown for you well i i use all the free assets i can get because we don't have much of a budget you know for paying paying some advertisement and all that i realized that media are craving for positive for good news because they don't have anything they don't have much to write about except for you know everyday politics and uh, this politician said that the other one replied that and all that crap and uh, news like this are very very popular and and sought for so i use that and i just you know they they need they need good news positive news i need media attention and and so this it's a nice way of of uh, cooperation and also i rely much on social networks on facebook on instagram on twitter these these proved as as very uh, successful tools in, uh, for reaching new people people that you might not uh, you know meet or or not, might not be able to talk to personally the positivity that you have is 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 quite astounding what are your plans for the future there are four products on the market now you have your home brewing set up where you try out the new recipes you know everybody and you said that you were a dreamer so dream, and I like dreamers. I like to dream as well. You know, when you dream, you dream either one or two steps ahead. Um, so without giving too much away, because I don't know, maybe somebody else is listening and wants to do the same thing, which wouldn't be a bad thing. It's yeah. stimulation. Um, Nicola's dream. My dream is to, to build a small brewery in the countryside uh, five minutes from here in the village of uh, Jakupovci. This was initial idea, actually, but... Uh, it proved that this investment was as double <laughs> as I planned initially, so I didn't have the money uh, to, to create this also. But yeah, that's, the, that's some kind of a long-term goal, to build a brewery on my own in the countryside and to, to present it you know, for tourists and everybody else as a place that you can uh, visit on weekends and get a beer in the brewery and sit by the plum tree and watch the hills and listen to chickens and... and you know, farm animals around you and just enjoy that, that sounds and enjoy that landscape, you know. Finally, you've taken a massive leap of faith by selling your apartment, by starting this business and working through the obstacles to get to where you are to try and get to that dream that, that, that you've been dreaming for so many years. If you had to give one piece of advice to anybody listening to this podcast, especially here in Bosnia and Herzegovina that has an idea but their parents are saying oh, you really need faculty oh, you should be working for the government oh, and, oh, and oh, like that what would that one piece of advice from somebody that's done it what would that be? Learn everything that you can learn uh, in your present situation and uh, you might need it sometimes and don't be afraid to try new things don't uh, stick around just in one little spot, one little place, one little job, go, out, go outside, to talk to different people, go to different envir environments, see how uh, things are going in other areas, in other cities, other countries, other streets. When you think of, a, of an idea and you think it, it, it might be good, don't be afraid to try to realize it. I mean, if you went to a college to become a dentist for 10 years, I don't know, one day you, you might come up with another idea that doesn't have any relation to this dentistry at all. Don't be afraid to, to go in that field, you know, in that area and to try to, to do that. Uh, don't, don't be stuck by your 
current level of education. You can always learn everything and you can master it if you are if you have will to do that. So everything is possible, I believe so. Some sound advice from Nikola Galic, the owner of the Gorstak Micro Brewery in Glamorchani, a small village between Laktashi and Banyaluka in the north of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast. You can find out how to do that through your normal podcast catcher, or you can find us on iTunes. But wherever you do find us, if you could leave a review, that would be great because it means the podcast is more searchable by people looking for content from here in the the Western Balkans. And until next time, please like, share and subscribe. Do join our Patreon community. It is really, really nice. It's a great group of people and you get exclusive access to content we produce on the blog, the vlog and of course here on the podcast. Until next time, please stay safe wherever you are. To find out more about us and where we live, why not check out our blog at anenglishmaninthebalkans.com. See you next time.